I'm going to tell you the story of the time that I paid money to wear a sarong. Now, if that's not a hook into a sermon, then I don't know what is, except for maybe the picture that I'm going to put up there. But look quick, because we're going to take it down fast. Um, so <laughs> here's the story. Okay, we can take it down now. <laughs> no, um, th- when I was in Indonesia teaching a couple of summers ago, uh, Pastor Bill Wilton and myself visited uh, the grounds of a Hindu temple, and we got off the got out of the car, and the first place that you come to is where all the tourists kind of mill around, and then you can there's a bridge that you walk across a little stream, and then you go through this large gate. And so that's what we did. We walked across that bridge and we walked through that gate. And as soon as we did that, then someone came up to us and said, no, 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 you can't go here. And we were a little confused about that. But he explained that you can't walk into that temple grounds in street clothing. You had to wear proper attire. And so, and then she explained, you can go and you pay, I don't know, a dollar or two to rent that and, um, and wear it. And then you're allowed to walk cross that bridge and through that gate into the actual temple structure, and you can look around there. And of course, that's because in the Hindu belief, in the Hindu religion, of course, they have sacred space. They have places that are designated as, you might say, holy ground. And you have to be properly prepared to walk onto that and to enter into that. And so, and, and of course, if we weren't prepared for that, then you don't belong on that holy ground. And that's Actually, a, a, that's a, I mean, that's a theme found in many religions is there's sacred space. There's designated places where you can or can't go. And, um, and this morning we're looking at that, in, too. We're looking, in, of course, in the Old Testament how the Jewish people had the tabernacle. The whole complex was really sacred space. It was set apart as, as really land or as a piece, a, a part in the camp of the Israelites as sacred space. It was holy. It was dedicated to, to God. And what I want us to do this morning is I wanted to look at, well, we're looking at the, the perimeter fence. We're going to call it a fence, it, but um, really it's a, um, it's a curtain. It was a curtain with all these posts every so, every, at every little interval there that created a perimeter, and that perimeter marks off the sacred space in the tabernacle complex. And I want us to look at not so much, well, the, the, the curtain, but also what is that space designate? What does that sacred space mean? And I think we're going to see two things. We're going to see how that sacred space is dedicated to the presence of God. We're also going to see how it's dedicated to the service of God's people, or we're going to say the holiness of God's people. And as you'll see, that means two different things. So space that's dedicated to God's presence and space that's dedicated to the holiness of God's people. One of the questions you might have had is we've been going through the, the tabernacle. We've spent the last, I think this is what, week five on the tabernacle. And frequently we're looking at the precious materials. And we've seen gold and we've seen silver and we've seen bronze. And now this morning we're looking at the fabric that would have been used for this, for this curtain. And it turns out that all of this material was really quite precious stuff. It was really very expensive. It was really ornate. One of the questions that might have crossed your mind is, well, where do these nomadic people come up with all this stuff? Like, there was at least a ton of gold. And I don't mean that figuratively. I mean, literally, a ton of gold. So where do the Israelites come up with all that gold in the middle of the desert? And some people have raised that question and said, well, you see, that's why we know that this really didn't happen. Well, the answer is actually very simple. Back in Exodus chapter 12, as the Israelites are leaving Egypt, we're told that God made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the Israelites, and they handed over all of their precious stuff, gold and silver and fabric and so on. And so we know that the Israelites, where the Israelites got the material, but there's more to it than that. You read a couple of times, even in our passage this morning, you read in verse 9 and then again in verse 16, you read of Number one, finely twisted linen. And you can think of that really as, I think, the best comparison is like Egyptian cotton. It's a very finely woven fabric. It would have been a very brilliant white color, which you you just have to imagine in the middle of the desert with all the browns and sort of the darker colors. And in the midst of that is this bright white curtain that must have stood out. And 
that gives the impression almost of, of royalty right there in the midst of the people. But you also read that um, there are uh, the, 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 the colorings that would have been used, um, purples and scarlets and blue and all these beautiful colors. Now, just give that some thought because how do you get material that color? You can't just go to Joanne's Fabrics and pick up you know, a ream of this material with any pattern you want. You just you don't have that option. And so how do you get color and into your material? And the answer is that actually in those days you'd go to the Mediterranean, to the Mediterranean Sea, and you'd find these mollusks, like these crustacean creatures, and you, I don't know how you'd extract it, but there's a, a, a dye or an ink that they, these mollusks would secrete, and then you could use that to color your fabrics the way you wanted. Now, you can just imagine the amount of work that goes into that, and so what that means is that the, uh, these, these dyes for, these, for material was very rare, it was very precious, it was very expensive, and therefore, it's really only used by royalty, kings and emperors and so on. And that's intentional because you begin to see that, we didn't look at it this morning, but the curtains underneath in this back part of the tabernacle structure, all of that was you know, dyed in these beautiful colors of royalty. And that gives you the impression that this is God's palace right there among his people. This tabernacle structure marks off God's royal dwelling place among his people. God is the king who is living on his throne in the midst of his people. And that's clearly one of the things that the tabernacle has, um, has, has demonstrated. Now, as for this fence, of course, a fence, you know, a fence serves a couple of purposes. One of the things that a fence does is it creates a border, right? I mean, it creates a boundary, and so your property even if you don't actually have a fence built, there's a property line there, and that property line designates where your piece of land begins and where your neighbor's ends. And so it's a very clearly marked line. Now, if it's not, as I said, fenced off, you know, the county records office will have exactly where that line is, and that's important because you need to know where your space is and where the neighbor's is and where they begin and end. And that's what this fence does. This fence marks off the the area of God's presence among his people. I can imagine, some of you, I can imagine a, a sharp middle schooler thinking, and maybe you've thought this as we've gone through, because we said the tabernacle is God's presence, it's where God was present among his people. I can imagine one of you sharp middle school students saying, well, wait a minute. I thought God was everywhere. I thought God is all over the place, and now you're saying he's only present here. That's a really good question. Right? If God is everywhere, why do we say that he's only in this space? And the answer, Calvin answers that actually, so we'll look to Calvin for a good answer to that. John Calvin says, well, of course God is everywhere, but he chooses to reveal his glory in one place. He comes down to his people, and he, Calvin uses the word, he condescends, which is he reveals himself to us in a way that we can see and experience and he chooses to do that in one place. But that doesn't mean he's not everywhere. He is everywhere, but he chooses to reveal his glory to the Israelites in this space. And the fence and the perimeter fence marks that boundary and establishes where God's presence would be. Now, the other thing that a fence does, a fence actually can be very restrictive. Right? A fence sets a boundary and it sets a marker. And it, it actually, if you think about it, it determines who can access and who can't. So think of it this way. If you, if you look out your front window and you see a complete stranger walking through your front yard, they've crossed a boundary. They've moved past a fence, either a literal fence or a figurative one. They've moved onto your property and your land. And if you don't know who that is, you're going to be paying attention. And maybe you find out it's the UPS person and so no problem. But maybe you find out it's someone else and you're going to pay a lot of attention because they've crossed that boundary into where they should not be. And that's what a fence does. Now, it turns out this, in a way, this fence actually served the same function. Now, this fence, you know, our, our, the, the challenge, of course, in reading the, the text is that you don't get, um, you know, you don't get a sense of the measurements of the, because it's all in cubits, and, you know, it's not like we have, you know, it's not in the metric system, it's not in the imperial system, and so... It's hard, to, um, it's hard to determine just how big is this fence. And I'll give you a real quick explanation of that. Um, it's, it's, 100, it's about 100 and, um, 
that's about 50 yards by about, uh, oh, I think it was about, uh, well, let's, let's do it in feet. It's about 150 feet by about 75 feet. So easiest way to imagine that is if you look at a football field, American football field, and you go from the 50-yard line to the end zone to the goal line, and then you go about from the goal line about halfway over, not quite half, but, but just about, and then back. So it's a rectangular space. That's how big the tabernacle structure was. But also, the text tells us in verse uh, 18 that the courtyard is, um, uh, it tells us how high it actually is. And it turns out it's, it is about seven feet high. And the reason I think that's important is because there's not too many people who are seven feet tall. And so for most people, you walk around the perimeter of this fence, you cannot see in. You can't observe what's going on. You can't be a spectator to all of the things that are happening inside the courtyard of the, of, the, uh, of the temple, of the tabernacle. You can't be a passive observer. So my wife and I, a week before last, we went downtown to, and we happened to walk by where they're building that new YWCA on the east side of downtown there. And we walked around the perimeter, and I don't know, it's kind of like I'm still maybe a boy at heart, but I like to look in and watch what's happening in there. I like to see the mis- construction and the machines and so on. Well. The fence is up, and they have that material in, so you really can't get a good look at what's taking place inside. And the fence of the tabernacle structure actually, in in some ways, functioned in the same way. It was high enough, you couldn't look over it, you couldn't see in. So it sets this boundary, it sets a perimeter, and there's only one way in. Now, you work your way around, and you come to the east side of the tabernacle. I realize it's a little hard to see, but... You come to the east side of the tabernacle, that's the one way into the tabernacle. There's only one way in. So you've got this curtain that restricts access. You've got this curtain that marks off the holy space. How do you experience that? How do you get into the presence of God? Well, again, it's through that curtain. Now, verses 13 through 16 describe that curtain, this entryway into the tabernacle. And the detail that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that it's on the east side of the tabernacle. That's not by accident. That's not just because it gets a nice view of the sunrise. See, in the Bible, especially you go into the book of Genesis and Exodus, especially in these early books of the Bible, eastward um, is is a, a theme that comes up over and over again, and it's a theme that represents movement away from the presence of God. So Adam and Eve are in paradise. They're in the Garden of Eden. This is the place of God's presence. This is the place where they walked and talked with God and they experienced close communion and fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. And then they're expelled from the Garden because they rebel against God. And the text tells us that they moved east of Eden. And then we get the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain kills Abel and he's sent as an exile. And guess which direction he goes? He moves further east. And then you get into stories of Lot and you get into stories like the Tower of Babel, and, you get, and, and there's this eastward progression, which is that you're moving away from the presence of God. You're getting further and further away from the place that we were created to be. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, if that's the case, then why is the gate on the east? Why is the gate furthest away from the presence of God? Well, the answer is because if you go, if you're on the east side, And you go through the gate, and you go through this curtain, and you go through that curtain. Guess which direction you're moving? West. You're moving back towards the presence of God. You see the picture that begins to emerge? The tabernacle is this place where God's people can begin this progression back towards the presence of God. Back to that place that we were created to be. The tabernacle points us back the way back to paradise, and it's through the gate. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus had this in mind when in John chapter 10, he's speaking to his disciples, and actually I'm I'm certain he's using kind of two metaphors at once. He's talking about being the good shepherd, but he also says something curious in that setting. Do you remember what he says? He says, I'm the gate. Now, do you see what he's getting at there? He's saying, I am the way back the presence of God. I am the one. It's through me that you will experience a reversal of Eden. It's through me that you will experience once again a return to paradise. It's through me that you will experience a return to that place that we were created to be. Jesus is the greater gate. He's the greater curtain. 
And just as a quick side note, you remember when Jesus is on the cross and he breathes his last and he cries out, do you remember what happened in the temple? The gate was torn wide open. The presence of God was open. And it's through Jesus that we gain access to God. It's through Jesus that we are brought back into the presence of God. Now, this is a claim that troubles many people. Not so much, in other words, look at it this way. I think, and I think this is maybe especially true here in Oregon, although maybe not, maybe it's elsewhere too, but in general, people are okay with you believing in Jesus. Right? They respect that. Okay, you're religious. I might not share your beliefs, but you're spiritual. That's fine. What people really have trouble with is when you claim that Jesus is the only way. If you say Jesus is a way, fine. If you say he is the way, well, you've got trouble. How dare you make such an exception? Exclusive claim. How can you claim that your religion is the only true and right religion? Anyone ever said that to you before? Have you ever heard that? How do you answer that? How do you respond? Let me suggest a couple of things. The first is this. Yes, that is an exclusive claim. You're claiming that Jesus is the only way. That is an exclusive claim, but guess what? All religions are exclusive. They all make different claims about how to get to salvation. Whatever, they, whatever these religions define salvation as, right? They all have different ideas. But whatever the claim is, they all claim theirs is the only way to salvation. These different ways to salvation are not, they're, they're, they're mutually exclusive. They can't all be true because they contradict each other. So logically, they cannot all be true. If it's the five-fold path or the five pillars of Islam, or if it's the path of Buddhism, or if it's reincarnation and paying off your sins by reincarnating over and over again, whatever it is, they're all different. They can't all be true. They're all exclusive. Here's where Christianity is different, and at least consider the claim here. All these other religions say, here's what you need to do. And you need to, you know, pass out tracts and pamphlets, or you need to be a really, really good person, or you need to follow the, you know, the pillars of Islam or the, the path of Buddhism and enlightenment, and you need to seek inner peace and so on. All of that's about what do you do. Now that's going to exclude a lot of people who can't or don't know how to exert that kind of effort, right? So the basis, the, 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 the burden falls on the person. Do this, and if you can't do it, you're excluded. Christianity says, it's not about what you do about what Jesus has done. So in that sense, we can say, broadly speaking, there's hope for anyone. Because it's not about what you do. You're not disqualified on the basis of your ability. You're disqualified on the basis of whether or not you receive and put your trust in the claims of Jesus. So let me just try to make this very concrete before we move on. I want you to imagine a, ma a mass murderer on his deathbed. Lived a terrible life, done horrible things, is there any hope for this person? All other religions would be forced to say no. Because there's no time to make up for all the bad that you've done. There's no time to find inner enlightenment. There's no time to do this, that, or the other thing. So you're, it's exclusive. Christianity would, for example, point to the thief on the cross and say he simply claimed Christ. So there's hope for even the worst of people. So yeah, Christianity is exclusive. They all are. Christianity points to the gate. Christianity points to the one that says, he's done it all for you. Now what does that mean? Just by way of application, real brief on this, and then we'll move into the, the part of God's people in service. First of all, becoming a Christian means putting your trust in Jesus. It's, it's personal. Becoming a Christian is not, well, I've gone to church my whole life. Becoming a Christian is not, well, I know my doctrine and my theology really well. Becoming a Christian is not, well, I've been a pretty good person. Becoming a Christian says, I'm claiming Jesus. I'm coming to Him, and my hope in Him is found in Him alone. We sang that song earlier this morning. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found. Personal. You come to a person. Second thing is that Jesus brings us into the presence of God. And that means that becoming a Christian means we experience His presence. And I think that has... Um, you just, just think of that in terms of, of, of worship, because that's one of the fundamental things that this means is that you're, you know, so for example, 
when you come to church. You know, we gather and worship with God's people and ask yourself and, and look and examine yourself. What kind of worship are you offering? Is it worship that's characterized by reverence and awe and joy? And your singing is a response that reflects that or is it just sort of, well, going through the motions and the routine? In Jesus, we're brought into the actual presence of God. Or think of your own personal devotional life when you pray and read scripture. Is this just sort of perfunctory stuff, you're just going through the motions and you're praying and you're asking God just for all the things that you need and nothing else? Or does your worship, does your, does your devotional life reflect that, that delight in God's presence and adoration and worshiping Him and, and just delighting in hearing His voice in Scripture? See, there's a difference. God's, the, the temple, the tabernacle structure marked off that presence, that place where God's presence was with His people and there was one way in through that curtain. Second thing is, second thing that this shows us is that the, the tabernacle and the, the fencing shows us the space that was devoted for God's people, for the holiness of God's people. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, um, in those days, in, in the tabernacle, you have to understand that there are really, you have to picture concentric circles, you know, like, like a target with the smallest place. And that, we said that earlier, that's at the very back here, and that's the the place called the Most Holy Place. And that's where the throne room of God was, that Ark of the Covenant where God's presence was. And then there's a little bit larger chamber called the Holy Place. And then there's this outer courtyard here. And then you go back through this gate, and then you can just imagine the Israelite camp around it. And then you go beyond that, and then you're into the Gentiles, into the rest of the world, essentially. Those are five um, spaces, and... The closer that you get to the back part here, to that most holy place, the closer you're getting to God's presence, the more was required in terms of moral and ceremonial purification. So God's presence, you might say, it's maybe not the best way to, to explain it, but God's presence is most concentrated here, and a le little less there, a little less here, little le right, and so you go out, at least in terms of his visible representation. And what that means is that the closer you get to his presence, the more you have to do to become purified, to be made ceremonially um, pure. So if you're a Gentile, anyone can be a Gentile, but if you want to live in the camp of the Israelites, well, you have to identify yourself with the Israelites. And if you want to come into the courtyard, you had to be an Israelite, and you also had to purify yourself by washing. And if you wanted to go into the uh, holy place, you couldn't just be a lay person, you had to be a consecrated person, i.e. a priest. And even then you had to be ceremonially clean. And if you wanted to go into that most central place, it not only had to be someone ceremonially clean, it not only had to be an Israelite, it not only had to be a priest, it had to be a high priest. And it couldn't be on any day of the week, it had to be on one day of the week. And you couldn't just purify yourself with water. You had to change your clothing and go through many other rituals to gain access. And so the closer you get to God's presence, the more holy you had to be, the more, you had, the more steps you had to take um, to make yourself holy. Now, the reason for that, of course, is that God is passionate and zealous for the holiness of his space. There's a story that's told in John's Gospel, in John chapter 2, where... All these people are buying and selling in the courts of the temple. All these people have come in and they're selling and changing animals and changing money. And Jesus looks at that and he sees that as a complete uh, desecration of the temple. And he gets furious. He gets angry because the holiness of God in the temple is being completely disregarded. And so he turns over the tables and he drives out the animals and he sends away the money changers and he says, and, and the people recognize zeal for the house of the Lord has consumed me. Jesus was passionate for the holiness of God's temple. Then Jesus says something really curious. Do you remember what he says? The Pharisees say, how dare you do this? What gives you the right? Who do you think you are? Give us some sign by which you have the authority to do this. And you remember he says, tear this temple down, and I'll rebuild it in three days. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? And the disciples understood only later that Jesus was saying, he's talking about himself, he's saying, I'm the new temple. I am that new place where holiness will be found. I am the new sacred space. The holiness of God will no longer be restricted or limited to this temple structure bound by this curtain fence or bound by the stone walls of the temple. 
The holiness of God's presence would be found in Jesus and then by extension, everyone in Christ. Everyone in Jesus then shares in that holiness. And that's what Peter picks up on, or uh, pardon me, Paul picks up on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He picks up on this idea because he, he's talking to the Corinthians who as a church were tolerating all kinds of sexual immorality and um, incestuous relationships and prostitution. They're all really just saying, eh, it's not such a big deal. And Paul says, wait a minute, don't you understand? You, church, are the temple. You are the holy space. You are the presence of God. And how dare you tolerate and just turn a blind eye towards sin in the temple of God. Now, I know, you know, we hear that today. And of course, in our culture, in this current cultural moment, the, the trend and the, the movement is towards all kinds of acceptance. And we think in terms of LGBTQ and sexuality and so on. And many of us share that concern that not only so much in culture, but even within the church that's being accepted. Right? Not just, not, we're talking behavior here, action. And there's tolerance and we're encouraged to just accept that. And many of us share that resistance to that. But can we just be honest and can I just encourage us to think through not just the sins that we immediately sort of latch onto and we want to fight against those, but like, what about tolerating, say, materialism? What about tolerating racism? What about tolerating um, pride? See, the point is, and we could go on, right? You understand that. The point is this. Wherever we find persistent sin as a church, we need to be a community that uh, helps and encourages one another to pursue the holiness of God's presence. It doesn't mean we go around condemning people the minute we see them making a mistake. But it's that we are a church that is committed to holiness in ourselves and in one another. And when we see people struggling, we commit to helping them to resist that sin and to put it out. That's one, one aspect. So when we talk about the, the temple or the tabernacle being a holy space for God's people, um, um, space for God's holy people. Holiness means two things. It means moral purity, which is what we just addressed, but it also means dedication to service. Holiness means you've been set apart for a purpose. You've been set apart to serve. And the same would be true in this tabernacle. So um, if you were to come into the, the temple, a lay person could walk through that, that curtain and they could bring their offerings. They could bring their, their gifts, but they couldn't offer it. That service was reserved for the priests, and we'll look at the priests next week. That service was something that the priests did on behalf of the people. And the same is true. You know, you go further and further in. A you know, priest could only go into there, and then only a high priest into the most holy place. And so there were sort of gradations of service. And the idea being that the priests, they served on behalf of all the people in, within, um, within the temple. But in the, um, in, the, in the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Peter says something absolutely astonishing. He, he says, and you can, you can see it here, we actually read part of it this morning as you, uh, from, from the same chapter, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by man, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Now listen, you yourselves are the living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's a fairly packed quote, packed verse. Simply put, what Peter is saying is that now because we are the church, anchored and built on Christ, we all participate in the service and in the ministry that once the priest would do on behalf of the people, now we all do it. We're all priests. We talk sometimes about the church being... Um, uh, the, the priesthood of all believers will all participate in service. And I want to apply this in two ways this morning, and then we'll conclude. The first way is this. Every last one of you, if you are a believer, you've been given spiritual gifts that are meant to be used in service in the life of the church, to build up other believers, to equip and to encourage them for um, growth in Christ. Every one of us has been given that gift or ability. Some of us, maybe you're still trying to figure out exactly what that is and you're not quite sure. Some of us know right what it is and, and you're plugged in. We all have gifts. There's not one person who can say, I'm a Christian, but I don't have any gifts. No. 
you heard a little bit this morning about the need for ETM, and this is my shameless plug, not just for ETM, but in the bulletin, there's a few other needs that we're going to anticipate in the fall. Needs for leadership. And so let me encourage you, let me exhort you, let me uh, call on you to ask yourselves, what is the gift that God has given me, and how can I use that in service of this church if you're not serving presently? That's point number one, application number one, because we're a Part of the, the all part of the priesthood, all meant to serve, then we all have to use our gifts in service of the church. That's the more narrow application. The more broad application says the kind of service that God wants of his people is not something that just happens on Sunday, and it's not just something that happens within the confines of the church. It's all of life. It gives you a whole new way to look at your vocation. Now notice I didn't say your job, I said your vocation, because some of you, your student. You don't collect a paycheck for that most times. Some of you are caring for your elderly parents. You don't collect a paycheck for that or a spouse. Right? Um, some of you are retired. Your service is more in the community. It's volunteer. And some of you, of course, you're working in finance or your law and you're in medicine and you're in this or in the business, all these different areas of, of life. Um, whatever it is that you are called to do, this text, this idea of, of all of us participating in the work of service says, here's a new way to approach your vocation. And boy, some of us, we, we need that because sometimes work feels so, it feels so much like drudgery. It feels so pointless and the thorns and the thistles of work make it so difficult. You wonder, does this make any difference? And Scripture teaches that because we're all gifted and called to serve as priesthood in our daily vocation, we serve as though we were serving the Lord Jesus himself. So whether you're doing laundry at home, whether you're studying for exams, whether you're caring for your loved one, whether you're selling a product, whether you're caring for people in the hospital, whatever it is that you do, you're going to do it with the same passion, the same commitment to quality, the same attitude, the same character as if Jesus Christ himself were your boss. You're going to do it with that same commitment same attitude, because you're participating in service to King Jesus. When I was younger, my, my, um, I have to be careful because now I find out my parents sometimes watch these videos, and so no more family secrets, right? But, but sometimes, you know, growing up as a kid, my dad would say something that probably you've all either said or you've heard before, and it would be on Sunday mornings, and you know, we're getting ready to get in the van and go to church, and it's always like, okay, it's time to go. We're going to God's house to worship him. God's house, and the idea being that the church there um, was God's house. And, and some of you have maybe said that before, and, and there's something right about that. There's something that I want to affirm about that, because it recognizes that churches are places that serve a, a, an important function. They're, they're places that are set apart for a, for a reason. And, and so if you're just using it sort of in the, in the metaphorical sense, it's great. But if, if, you, you know, if you start to think that the church is really limited just to these four walls, however many walls here, this building's a little oblong, right? But if, you're, if you start to think of it in terms of literal terms, of course that's wrong because, because the presence of God is not limited or confined to a building. The, 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 the dwelling of God, the tabernacle, the temple, is God's people. He's given us a way in. He's given us a gate, as, if it, as it were, to enter into the presence of God and to worship and enjoy God and to serve Him in all that we do. Friends, if we've walked through that gate, if we've gone through that curtain, then we are in the presence of God, not just one day a week, but in all of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for, again, this picture of Your holy presence among Your people, Your dwelling place, Your, um, your, your throne room. And we thank you that your presence continues even today. We thank you that uh, you are here among us and that you are with us when we go into our places of work and study and home and in family and you call us to do everything as if we're serving you. So help us to do that. Help us to, to look at even the, the most mundane tasks of daily life and the most taxing um, parts of our, of our life as, a, as an opportunity to serve you. Help us to identify ways in which we can serve in your church and encourage and equip other believers. And help us to enjoy your presence in worship.
We ask and pray this in Christ's name, the one who gives us access to you in his name. Let's stand together.